Hello. Welcome to the Alex webinar, Securing Patron Privacy. I'm Matt Montgomery from the College of San Mateo. I'm a member of Alex Continuing Education Committee, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Dorothea Salo. Dorothea is faculty associate in the School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where she teaches about scholarly communication and publishing, metadata, and library archives technology. She has written and presented internationally on patron privacy, copyright, institutional repositories, linked data, and data curation. She holds an MA in Library and Information Studies and another in Spanish from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. There are a few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. All attendees are muted. If you have a question for Dorothea, please type them into the question box on your screen and she will answer them at the end of the presentation. Our software does not have interactive ch chat capabilities. You may use the Alex hashtag if you wish to use Twitter to comment on today's presentation. The hashtag is A-L-C-T-S-C-E. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so please use the question box to submit questions and comments. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides. And now, here's Dorothea. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. All right, just a second here. Hopefully you should be seeing. Let me go back actually to the beginning here. So hi folks, and thank you for being here today. I feel a little bit Charleston left behind, but I'm glad you're all here with me. I do appreciate your time. Now I'm assuming I have some catalogers, some access services folks, including interlibrary loan, some e-resources folks, maybe some systems folks, some managers thinking about privacy policy, quite a variety. I will try to reach you all at least sometimes, but one thing I do want you to know is that I realize I will sometimes be talking about stuff that is out of your individual control. No one person has infinite power over library systems but all of you listening to me now do have some power, and I hope and believe that you want to use that power wisely. A couple of recent news items first. In the UK, a man was arrested recently for downloading on a college campus an electro electronic copy of our old friend, the Anarchist Cookbook. If you think this couldn't happen to an ebook or e journal using patron on this side of the pond, I'm not even sure what to say to you right now. Whoops. Slide too far. Sorry about that. Close to my home in Wisconsin, there was a pretty big data breach in the circulation system at a public library consortium. Whoever the hackers were, they actually got some good stuff, stuff that should not be public knowledge and stuff that can absolutely be used to mess with people's lives online and off. And I'm asking myself, did the consortium actually need this information? Email address is okay, I totally get it. But do you need actual birth dates or do you just need to know whether somebody's an adult or a minor? Do you need to store that ID record number or is it enough to record that a librarian verified somebody's ID? Because basically this breach here is the library analog to Equifax as far as the information leak goes. There are identifiers here that are connected to personally identifiable information and this is not good. And if you think this can't happen to your library or your consortium, again, I'm not even sure what to say to you. Except that I used to invite my friend, IT manager Mike Simpson, to talk to my library technology classes about security. And the first thing he would always say is, you will be hacked. You will. Get ready for that. We, as librarians, have committed to patron privacy, at least out loud. And among the many, many reasons it matters that we've made that commitment, we are being looked to as ethical exemplars with respect to privacy. Now, Pinboard, the quoted tweet here, it's an online bookmarking service that I use that's run by uh, Maciej Saglovsky, who's an amazing privacy advocate in technology-centric communities. 
And who is he looking to as a privacy example for the technology industry, which really needs one? He's looking to libraries. I have concerns about this. I mean, it is wonderful to be recognized for our ethical stance, but I have concerns. I really do. I am not sure that we are living up to our public stance in deed or even in word. Now, here's one thing that Mache admires, and rightly so, from the American Library Association Code of Ethics, Article 3. We protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. And as it turns out, Alex actually has some supplementary guidelines to the ALA Code of Ethics. I pulled out two that I think are interesting. Number six, we establish a secure and safe environment for staff and users. I really like this one. I'm glad it's in there. Congratulations. And number seven, fosters and promotes fair, ethical, and legal trade and business practices. I want you to keep all of these in the back of your head as I speak and measure the things that I'm telling you against your sense of what is fair and ethical. Because look, lots of stuff that damages privacy is nominally legal. That's an incredibly low bar, especially in the United States. So I want libraries not just to pass that bar, but leap over it in a single bound like Supergirl. So please don't get stuck on legal. Please remember fair and ethical as well. So with that as context, let's try to figure out how to think holistically about securing patron privacy. shoot hang on all right let me see what I can do here all right can you hear me now is that better okay then we'll go on from here Sorry about that. That is not something that has happened before. I'll go back to the beginning of this slide because I think that's where you lost me. Interested in thinking holistically about securing patron privacy. Professional information security people say that to protect people's data, to protect their privacy, you have to think like the people who are attacking you to get at those data. This is called adversarial thinking if you want to look it up. So you ask yourself, who your adversaries are, and then you ask yourself how they're going to get at data that compromises patron privacy and how you're going to stop them. This way of thinking also helps you look for privacy problems and advocate for privacy. Privacy is a really big word. It's so big that even privacy advocates don't always agree on its definition. So if you can think about privacy in a fairly organized, holistic fashion, I think that helps you see where your organization might be making privacy mistakes and advocate usefully for fixing them. So this taxonomy here of patron data adversaries, people who are going after patron data, is my own invention. I am not wedded to it. But as a first approximation, I think our adversaries in the information security sense can be boiled down into omnivores, opportunists, and paparazzi. The National Security Agency, the NSA, is a data omnivore. Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Taboola, DoubleClick, all the other online ad and traffic networks, commercial data brokers like Axiom, they are data omnivores. Black hat hackers are typically omnivores. 
if there's data about people, any data at all, omnivores want it. And not only that, they want to match your individual data to you. Oh, wow. Am I lost again? Well, hopefully that's a delay. Okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> the only way to prevent a data omnivore from, you know, exploiting individuals' data is to keep those data out of their greedy paws. Even when those people are actively lying to you, hiding the extent of their data collection and data reuse, and trying to subvert any effort you make to kick them out of your systems. And sometimes the only way to prevent that is not to collect or keep the data at all. Intentionally refusing to collect or keep data is called data minimization. And I absolutely think it's a principle that libraries should commit themselves to. Data that you do not have cannot leak, cannot be hacked, and cannot be misused by a malicious insider, which is absolutely an unfortunate thing that happens. Now, opportunists, data opportunists, are trying to do cool and hopefully useful things with data. They're academic researchers and data collectors trying to be nice to academic researchers. They're web developers, social media developers, usability experts, they're hackathoners, open data advocates, assessment experts. They're library administrators trying to talk numbers to provosts, chancellors. Um, library boards, municipal government. Data opportunists are people with their hearts in the right place, and they're often people under pressure. But that doesn't mean they've thought things through, and unfortunately, it does not always justify their data collection, data use, data communication practices. What I'm seeing right now is that data opportunists are making some amazingly big and scary privacy messes. Speaking more broadly, another thing the data opportunists in libraries specifically are doing is normalizing data surveillance. Like, I don't have time today to talk about why the current digital panopticon is a bad thing, but there are books on this. You can read them. Dragnet Nation by Julia Angwin, Data and Goliath by Bruce Schneier. All right. What I want you to take away, though, is if our much trusted libraries participate in digital panopticons for any reason, even a good reason, we are ultimately telling our patrons, it's okay. Just lean back and let big online brother watch you from the telescreen. And that is not okay. That is not who we are as a profession, I dearly hope. Now, data paparazzi, these folks have a target. They have a specific person or people that they are tracking. And they pursue that specific target through whatever data they can get their hands on. These are people on political crusades. These are doxers. These are people who send SWAT teams to people's homes. They send debt threats. They are kidnappers, perpetrators of violence. These are people who hate and who harm. And from a security point of view, paparazzi are terrifying because they are obsessed, they are completely amoral, and they will stop at nothing. They will social engineer you, they will hack your systems, try to use them against your, their target. They will take over a target's account to impersonate them, to learn more about them, or to ruin them. And they will correlate whatever they find out from you about their target with anything else they can find anywhere. So don't be thinking, well, they don't want the data libraries have. Sure, they absolutely do. So when you're thinking about patron privacy with respect to data you're collecting or data you control, you should ask yourself, could a data omnivore get their paws on this? What could a well-meaning opportunist do that's damaging? Is somebody going to get doxxed or swatted by paparazzi if these data of ours leak? That is adversarial thinking in a nutshell. 
love to see tech services and access services folks doing more of it. Here's another taxonomy I kind of invented. This time a taxonomy of the patron data libraries want to worry about. So I'll take these one at a time and then, because I'm sure you've been waiting for this, I will give you some library specific examples of what I mean. Personally identifiable information or PII as it's often called. The thing about PII is everybody knows about it, right? But too many people think that it's the total extent of the patron privacy problem. It's really not. But a lot of vendors who really don't give a flip about privacy will do this little dance of deceit where they're really, really loud about how careful they are with PII, but they don't say anything about what they do with supposedly anonymized data, never mind long tail info and behavior trails, which I'll get to in a moment. So as people who have a fair amount of control over e-resources, watch out for the dance of deceit. Anybody who's doing it is probably hiding something that threatens privacy. Don't let these people get away with it. Read vendor privacy policies carefully. Please be prepared to call them on that and demand that they do better. Because who else is going to do it? Who else is going to call vendors on their privacy policies if not us? All right, what I call long tail information. Long tail information is information about any person that makes them stand out from the crowd. What this does is let a data attacker narrow down a big data set, even an anonymized one, to one person, even though that person is not actually identified. There is so much data floating around about individuals these days that long tail information in most data sets cannot be assumed to remain anonymous. If somebody tries hard enough, they can use long tail information in a system or a database to identify individuals and then tie them to whatever else the system or the database knows about them. Or even worse, whatever else any other system or any other database already knows about them. Such as their behavior trails whatever traces their behavior leaves in a system, like your OPAC, your ILS, or your collection of electronic resources, or your proxy server, which is a necessary part of many library systems, but also a huge and scary collection of individually identified, often, behavior trails. Now, behavior trails all by themselves can be identifying. An adversary, particularly paparazzi, might not even need a name or identifier to pick somebody out. Take me, for example. My constellation of professional interests, linked data, privacy, scholarly communication, probably unique on campus. You think? I'm a little weird. I'm betting, okay, that somebody who knows what my professional interests are like a lot of you, I shouldn't wonder, could use my library information behavior to identify me in proxy server logs. I don't even think it would be hard. The other thing about behavior trails is that they can actually be exactly what an attacker is interested in. Data omnivores love behavior trails. So the more information that our systems collect, transmit, and keep, about patron information behavior in our systems, the more information those systems can then leak about patron behavior. One more thing about behavior trails, usability and usage assessment research and research tools like behavior trails a lot. I understand that both usability and usage assessment are big parts of your jobs as technical services professionals. This means, I have to ask you to be critical about the research tools you use. What data do those tools collect about your patrons? How long is that data retained? Is that data aggregated with other data not from your organization for analysis? 
because that, that aggregation can make individuals easier to pick out from the crowd. Finally, can that data be sold? Can it be transferred? You really need to know these things before you adopt a particular tool. All right, so it's example time. You might think there's no way libraries would compromise personally identifiable information. Come on, we know better. But we do, sometimes without even thinking. Now I'm indebted to Angela Galvan for letting me retell this story. Angela suggested the purchase of a book for the library where she worked. And when the book came in, the, the cataloger put Angela's name in the 970, as you can see here, since Angela had made the suggestion. Because that's just how things were done and nobody had thought about it in over a decade. Angela, in her original pe uh, presentation, which the talk notes for it, the URL is there, she called this a vestigial workflow. Similar story I've heard, though I can't quite pinpoint its origin. A library was putting order history information in what I think was the 981. And some of those fields included staff members, staff ID numbers. You don't want to do that. That's an Equifax style mistake. You don't ever, ever want to reveal an ID number that's actually the key to a lot of additional information about people. This kind of thing, it's not safe. It's not secure. Not for users, including donors and suggestors. It's not safe or secure for staff. So what I suggest here is audit your catalog, your cataloging, your e-resource workflows for these vestigial privacy violators and just root them out, make them go away. Here's one that I used to deal with myself. When I was running Minds at UW, the Wisconsin Systems Consortial Institutional Repository, when a borrowing request for a local dissertation came in, the interlibrary loan folks would scan it to PDF. And in addition to getting the PDF to the borrower, they put the PDF in the repository in an open or closed collection, depending on the copyright situation. It's a nice little workflow, I appreciated it. And the open dissertations actually got quite a bit of extra use. So far, so good. Now, way back in the day, whenever someone outside Wisconsin borrowed a dissertation, the circulation department wrote down the borrower's full name, sometimes their affiliation, and the borrow date on a designated loan page right after the title page. Yikes, right? But in the 2000s, because nobody told them otherwise, the people who were scanning the dissertations for borrowers and for the IR faithfully scanned the loan page along with everything else and put it online. People's signatures were in there. I, yeah. So once I noticed that this was happening, I saw one in the repository, loan page intact, howled in horror, checked all the dissertation PDFs, pulled them down, ripped those loan pages out so that I could repost them in the repository. And I got to tell you, this was not just a theoretical patron privacy threat. I saw on those loan pages names with dates as recent as the 1990s. I, you know, I don't know who in the libraries back in the day thought putting borrowers actually in the dissertation was a good idea or even baseline ethical. That's completely contrary to the ALA code of ethics. But you know, sometimes all we can do is fix things after the fact. So long tail information, libraries handle a lot of long tail information around information use. Think about your own library mediated information use. Who else where you work uses exactly the same eBooks and databases that you do? Anybody even close? Could your constellation of eBooks be compared to your Facebook or your Amazon or Goodreads reviews to pick you out of a crowd? And don't laugh about this because exactly this actually happened. Netflix recommender contest, actual anonymized data released, and a couple of computer scientists correlated it with movie reviewers on IMDb to pick out individuals. 
And, you know, just to make the idea of re-identifying somebody by their information use appropriately awkward, let's imagine somebody who identified me, me myself, by my library usage in, let's say, 2010 or 2011. If that attacker poked around further, that attacker would have discovered my sudden devouring interest in cancer of unknown primary origin. Now, no, I do not have this terrible disease. A close family member was dying from it, which was why I was curious. But real easy to jump to that false conclusion, isn't it? Why, the why behind our information use is a question that behavior trails often lead people to jump to false and dangerous and harmful conclusions about. That is a concrete privacy harm that long tail information about patron information use can create. Here's a real world example. Library hose happened at Harvard University Libraries very briefly. As an outreach tool, Harvard built a bot that tweeted out the title of each book checked out from its library. And the bot would tweet at pretty much exactly the time that the book was checked out. Doing the same thing, ebooks, e journals, absolutely possible. I'm very glad that Harvard didn't try it. And I'm sure they were thinking, we're not tweeting PII, we're not treating the patron's name or any other identifier, so we're okay. Well, no. Anybody physically watching the circulation desk or the exits at Harvard with the library host tweet stream running super super easy to match people with checkouts timestamps timestamps are classic long tail information they limit that checkout data set to one or only a few people surveillance footage would do the same thing and in the e-resources realm it's really really easy to correlate timestamps via server access logs or even network packet sniffing so there was an outcry. Harvard took this amazingly bad idea offline, but it just goes to show. Long tail information lurks where you don't expect it. You have to watch those timestamps. With any data you're collecting about patron behavior, leave out the timestamps if you can, fuzz the timestamps if you must, and certainly don't tweet them. And then there's library research and assessment. This is from a very recent article in college and research libraries. In a paragraph laying out the demographics of their sample, they specify down to a group with 18 people in it. 18. Those of you who are conducting research for tenure or assessment or usage analysis or usability or any other reason, do not do this. This is classic exposure of long tail information. The term of art is accidental disclosure. I bet you if this underlying data set ever leaks, those 18 Hawaiian students would be individually identifiable at the drop of a hat, along with all the other information in that data set about them, their majors, lots of other stuff that's just plain nobody else's business. Now, a colleague of mine, actually called college and research libraries on this, contacted the editor, said, hey, this is maybe not a good idea. CNRL responded that this was okay, they were not going to redact it, because the study only examines library use, which is not a protected piece of information, and they weren't even thinking about the other information that's in this data set, and let me just take that a piece at a time. Library use is not protected information. Really? It's not. Um, the library is not an information resource, not protected under Article 3 of the ALA Code of Ethics. I have real problems with that analysis. The other thing is that I think CNRL and other journals have a duty to be concerned, not just about the identifiability of people in the article, but the identifiability of people in the data set underlying the article. 
you have to be concerned about what other information about these patrons could get correlated with these data. Fundamentally, though, it is nobody's business which individuals do or do not get information from a library. I strongly believe that college and research libraries made the wrong call here. And for those of you who do research and assessment, please make the right call. Do not publish small ends. It's dangerous. So the main takeaway I want you to take away with respect to individuals' behavior trails is that they are the big data gold rush. Behavior trails are what data omnivores are chiefly after, and they really help data paparazzi hurt people. Behavior trails are mineable, they are combinable. They are identifiable with or without actual personally identifiable information. They are saleable, no questions asked, and they are in fact sold, reused all over the place. The NSA doesn't even have to snoop a whole lot of information about people. They can just buy it from ad networks and content vendors. They are everywhere, these behavior trails. And because they're everywhere, almost any new behavior trail is trivial to attach to the live human person who created it. The inevitable corollary is that collecting and keeping behavior trails never mind facilitating their reuse by researchers, vendors, assessors, whoever, is a clear and present danger to individual patrons' information privacy. So where do behavior trails turn up in technical services? The answer is, I promised to come back to this and now I am. Um, the omnivores are inside the library. And if you think I'm riffing on a classic horror movie trope, you are right because I find this horrifying. The data omnivores are inside the library and they're called e-resource vendors. Our buddies at Adobe got caught red-handed, transmitting individual users' reading behavior back to the Adobe mothership. Not even just which books they were reading, which is bad enough, but how much of each book and which parts of each book. All of this was tied to a user identifier, of course, so there, Adobe isn't even really trying to anonymize this. And it gets worse. They were transmitting their data in the clear over the internet, not encrypted at all. So they got caught and they said, oops, bad us, we'll fix that. But what was their fix? Their fix was encrypting the data in transit. They are still collecting those data they are still storing those data. They are still mining those data. I would not be at all surprised to find out, and I must be clear, I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised to find out they are selling those behavior trails to the big data brokers. So what did we do, we librarians, given that Adobe fuels a lot of ebook programs? Once Adobe started encrypting the data in transit, not a thing. Not a dang thing did we do. We have let data omnivore Adobe destroy the privacy of ebook loving library patrons, and we have done nothing. Do you see now why I have concerns when Maciej Slavkovsky holds us up as privacy exemplars? Then there's this one, and let me tell you, ad networks are the worst of the worst data omnivores. You know that they are selling the data they collect to anybody with a credit card. That is their business model. It's what they do. Privacy issues aside, ad networks commonly spread malware, as we saw actually quite recently with Equifax and TransUnion, who were showing ads with malware just when everybody was rushing to their websites. So yeah, when our vendors put ad networks on their journals, that's privacy endangerment. It is wrong and we should not put up with it in silence. Would also love it if e-resources folks, tech services folks, library administrators argued with library IT to include tracker blockers by default on library patron computers. Ad blockers, okay, I get that there's an intellectual freedom argument for not using them, but there are blockers that can be configured to focus on tracking only. And unless and until we can shame content producers and vendors 
into not collecting or selling behavior trail data, I am in favor of trying to reduce the privacy harms in other ways. So I called out college and research libraries earlier. I want to say something nice about them. Here it is. This article, College and Research Libraries, it is fantastic. It is open access. You should absolutely read it if you haven't already. As you may recall, I started this talk with the ALA Code of Ethics and the ALEX Supplementary Guidelines to it. And here's the thing about that. E-resource vendors do not even have analogous ethics codes. They promise nothing with respect to patron privacy. So spoilers, the conclusion this article comes to is no, library vendor policies do not meet our privacy standards. I mean, you probably guessed that. So all of you who choose vendors, who negotiate with vendors, who set up library technology to work with vendor offerings, who use vendor data and assessment, you are the only people with any hope of changing this. So what else can we do about all this? I really like Angela Galvan's formulation here. She says, I can value privacy all I want, but it's workflows and systems that determine how accurate this is for my patrons. I'm gonna assume you all know how to do a workflow audit, catalog audit, the kind of thing that's gonna catch Angela's 970, so I'm gonna skip that. Not because it isn't important, it totally is, but because I'm kind of running out of time here. And I'm not the best person to talk about tech services workflow and catalog auditing anyway. What I do want to talk about is systems. For system stuff that's directly actionable, I don't even have to walk through this, which is good because that would take me a while. Here on the ALA website, ala.org slash advocacy slash privacy slash guidelines specific actionable guidelines thanks to ALA's Intellectual Freedom Committee and a bunch of volunteers. The ones most applicable to tech services and e-resources folks is actually most of them, although, you know, depending on your environment, there will be some that aren't quite as relevant. But cheer up. The lists here are not hugely long and they're fairly understandable. So I invite, encourage all of you, dive into these lists and see what you can make better. But let me pull out a couple, three examples in another related document that I suggest you read. This particular example I'm in, indebted to Andromeda Yelton for. Sometimes it turns out that privacy violation is baked right into the standards that our systems are based on. So SIP2, a lot of you are probably familiar with it. It's designed to communicate between self-checkout machines inside a brick and mortar library and the library circulation system. And SIP2's designers reasonably assume that the network hookup there would be wired ethernet, which is pretty secure, pretty private. So they didn't demand that the data be encrypted for communication. I mean, they should have just on principle, but I can kind of see why they didn't. And then library ebooks happened. And so libraries needed a way to communicate with ebook vendors in order to make a checkout happen. And SIP2 was just kind of sitting right there, so they used it. So now data about patrons and their ebook checkouts is flying around unencrypted over the public internet. Y'all, I can teach an undergrad how to sniff unencrypted data over the internet. I'm actually going to be doing that this summer. I'm launching a mixed grad undergrad class on digital privacy, safety, and security. I'm just saying it's not hard. So two questions out of this. Do you know whether your ebook vendors encrypt SIP2 communications? Are you sure? And do you know what patron data you're transmitting to your ebook vendors who cannot be trusted? over SIP2, because it actually asks for a whole lot of patron data. And maybe the vendor does not need or should not even get all those data. Now, nobody intended this privacy-destroying outcome. It was an accident. I get that. But who is going to prevent and remedy accidents like this if not us? So I encourage you, 
ask about the technology you're working with. Ask where it collects patron data, where that data goes. I know it can be hard to ask. Nobody wants to admit they don't know something. I'm saying, please do the hard thing. Ask anyway. Make people draw you diagrams, whatever it takes to find mistakes like this. So the NISO consensus principles on users, digital privacy and library publisher and software provider systems, also known as the NISO privacy principles. I didn't give you the URL because it's terrible. Um, plug it into a search engine. I recommend DuckDuckGo. Now I have to say, not a huge fan of this document. I don't think it goes far enough. I think it's toothless. I think it's wishy-washy. I think it's far too invested in bankrupt notions of, oh, we can violate their privacy if we just tell them, otherwise known as notice and consent. And it's way too easy for flagrant privacy violators to hide behind, but this document does have some guidance for our systems and how we treat them that I think is useful and actionable. And it's something that you can use to advocate with your higher ups for better privacy practices. I think they'll take this seriously. So here we go. So this is totally a wall of text. I don't expect you to read it all on the spot. The point here is a lot of today's digital panopticon exists because nobody realizes it's happening. There's no transparency around it. Nobody's educating anybody on it. So one of the things tech services and e-resources folks can, could conceivably do, and I would love to see this happen, is deliberately make some of this more visible. So just as an example, who is Overdrive invited into their patron data? Google, it turns out. Look, um, library computers, ser browser search bars, please don't default to Google. Default to DuckDuckGo, which does not track searchers. And oh joy, there's something even better here, a behavior trail collection company called New Relic. Awesome. I spent like half an hour puzzling through New Relic's privacy policy to figure out if it's selling behavior tra trail data that it gathers for its customers. And you know what? I still don't know. And all by that by itself, that makes me suspect that they are. So is that information in your catalog? Is it in, is it in your database descriptions? Is it in your outreach materials for OverDrive? How about your knowledge base of your staff training materials? Well, if it's not, why not? How'd I find this out? Well-known browser plugin called uBlock Origin. It's simple to install, not super hard to glean information from. I suggest using it to figure out and communicate out about how your vendors are selling out your patrons' privacy. How about our good buddy, good old pal Elsevier? Wow, this is not good. Social network behavior trail web bugs from Add This and Twitter. Google, of course, because everybody sold out to Google. Seriously, if your library is using Google Analytics, just on principle, get that stopped. Our unreliable data omnivore buddies at Adobe are here, and then Optimizely, you can look them up. They're another behavior trail collector like New Relic. And Elsevier is getting away with this. Why? Because it's not apparent to people. So be thinking about this. How can you make it apparent? So that leads me to this NISO principle supporting anonymous use. I don't like the word anonymous here. It doesn't go far enough. It covers PII, but it's not clear to me that they're covering behavior trail and long tail information. There's too much cover for information omnivores and even information opportunists here. So I wanna make a stronger statement. Libraries should, should support information usage that is not tracked in any way beyond what is absolutely necessary and not just necessary for anybody in any reason, that is weasel wording in action. I mean necessary for the library to function at all. Will I trash assessment in favor of patron privacy? I sure will, watch me. Now we know how to keep behavior around analog materials like print books private. You keep minimal information, you keep information on the stuff, not the people, you keep your data secure and you only keep individual data as long as a book is out of the building. What I don't understand is why we're not carrying the same principles into e-resource design. And these two principles from the NISO document, 
I will leave you with because surprise, I agree with them. Though I do think the flavor text on accountability could be stronger. We can't get all this right right away. Not gonna lie to you, it's hard and we will have to pick our battles. There's a lot of moving pieces here and for data opportunists especially, a tremendous amount of very scary pressure from the powers that be to compromise on patron privacy. So figure out your own ethical stance, work out how close you are to achieving it, and then try to do a little bit better every single day. That is all I or anyone else can ask of you. But please hold yourselves accountable. Do not hide behind research or assessment or the powers that be or personalized learning, which don't even get me started. That is a dog whistle for surveillance or, but it's the vendor. The library is the conduit between vendors, researchers, assessors, the powers that be, and our patrons. If any of these people or organizations sells out the patrons' privacy, that's on the library. And since you work for the library, it is on you. And it's on us, really. It's on all of us. A short list, very abbreviated, unordered lists of people and organizations that are doing good work in this area. Um, and when I say watching, I absolutely do not mean in the paparazzi sense, that would be terrible. And I want to close by saying thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for caring about this. And I haven't gone over too far, so we do still have some time for questions. Hi, thank you, Dorothea. That was a really compelling talk. Thank you. Um, we've already got one question in. Okay. Hello? Okay. Um, we already have one question in, and I encourage you all to submit additional questions and comments using the question box. Uh, the, f the first question came in, you, I think you kind of answered it towards the end there, but the first question yeah. that came in, um, as rank and file librarians, what mm -hmm. can we do when administration and patrons demand ease of access to e-resources? Yeah, that's really hard. I get that. It is so difficult. Um, with patrons, I think there are two answers. One answer is policy. The other answer is education. And they're not cheap and easy answers, but they're the answers that I have. Um, now, I'm a flaming radical when it comes to administration, so keep that in mind as I say that this is another place where if libraries don't push back, nobody else is going to. Um, I don't think that's a world we necessarily want to live in. We all know what's going on with Facebook, Twitter, ad targeting, um, democracy undermining, you name it. I don't think we want to be part of that. So that puts us in an incredibly vulnerable and scary position. And I am fully cognizant of how vulnerable and scary it feels. Um, but we're what there is. We are what there is to resist the digital panopticon. And I hope we can do it. And I hope we can do it successfully. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? If not, you know where I am. You have my. E you can find my email address and my Twitter very easily, and I'm happy to talk more about this. Great. Well, um, if there's no more questions, I encourage you, any of you, to submit any. Otherwise, yes, please get in touch with Dorothea. Um, her contact information is on that slide and we are really glad you could be with us today you will soon receive a short online evaluation form please take a few minutes to respond to the questions your comments are very valuable and help Alex continuing education committee plan for future events I'd like to thank Mary Reeder and Wanda Jazzieri of the Alex Continuing Education Committee and to Megan Doherty and Jasley Cooley of the Alex Office for technical support. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. We have a few more events coming up this fall. 
as you can see, our next one is just catalog it, providing access to 3D materials, and that is followed by update on the RDA 3R project. This concludes our session. Thank you for joining us.